pipes in there for the uh, for Arizona operations, and then those feeds are actually used for them to direct other aircraft or border patrol agents to interdict the people that are crossing the border, whether they're drug smugglers or people that are crossing the United States illegally, uh, to actually put them on those particular targets. So, what are some of the holes that we have here? Well. One of it is, you see a lot of arrows there. Most of those arrows are radio communications. Now, the first arrow from the UAS down to the op center is actually a data link, and that's good. So they can actually see the uh, UAS displays in the op center, and they can direct people you know, based on what they see towards where the uh, actual detection is. Uh, but beyond that, it's not really networked. So if I'm talking to an aircraft, or I'm talking to a border patrol agent, it's just that, it's a radio, I've got to pass coordinates, They've got to plot it. They've got to figure out where to fly the airplane. None of that part of it is automated. And that's part of what we're trying to do uh, both in the land and the maritime is give, get better automation out of that. So I would just say that's one of our missing uh, links on the land side. The other side I think that is uh, immature for us is in terms of investigations. So that means that I don't have necessarily great <coughs> linkages with investigative priorities on the borders to the actual operations I'm conducting. That's actually a CBP problem overall for the agency. And that's something that we're uh, working through now, which I think the, uh, the uh, creation of the joint task forces, West, East, and investigations will help us integrate that better. But that's been a struggle for us here. And uh, I would just offer that you have a very wide open border, very large, thousands of miles of border. Having information about where to employ your assets on that border is critical. We're obviously not going to join hands and, you know, block the border off. That's not going to occur. Uh, and I would also mention an area that's also immature, which is not so much in your realm, is, is how I get source information. So we actually uh, are starting a program to buy source information uh, from criminals. Uh, so that's an area that uh, has some uh, finesse required with it and some controls required. But that's another way that you get your information more targeted than you, than you have now. Uh, where you know you have more of a wide open border from that standpoint. Next slide. So that was the that was the land side. This would be the maritime side. So on the maritime side, I have another number of platforms I do, and also the Coast Guard does. I might mention that can detect assets uh, on the water. We have the Predator UAS. We have the P3, the Orion aircraft, which we've just finished re or just about to finish rewinging the aircraft. We're bringing on the multi rule enforcement aircraft. The maritime configured version of that has a radar on it, so it can detect actually assets moving across the water. That information uh, can be linked, well, I should say, take that back. So again, the Predator can link into the Ops Center, the Air Marine Ops Center in this case. The P3 and the MEA, that's a capability I want to get on the platforms, can't do it right now. And then when I actually moving a interceptor, either a helicopter or a coastal interceptor, or uh, as indicated, there are a Coast Guard cutter that's farther out, that's again gonna be done via, via radio communications. It'd be passed to, you know, to the particular uh, uh, director that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, local office for us or for the Coast Guard district. Uh, we pass that information up to the district headquarters, <coughs> excuse me, and they can look at uh, what they want to actually vector out there. <coughs> excuse me. So, I, so again, the, the, the difficulty here for me is networks. Uh, I don't have a lot of networks. This is one of the missing pieces for us here. Uh, between my op centers and my platforms, we need to work on that. I need better connectivity. As I've already discussed, uh, investigations and source information is a problem. One of the big challenges here in the maritime is you have a lot of boats moving back and forth. Okay, you have overt activity, you have covert activity, you have illegitimate, you have, illeg you have legitimate and illegitimate activity, and part of that is figuring out what is legitimate and what is illegitimate. And that gets back to the issue of investigations because you know, a legitimately registered vessel may be carrying, you know, contraband on it, drugs, arms, money, something like that. And to target yourself and you need better coordination on the investigation side. That's, that's one of our challenges. And then I would also mention that, uh, that maritime domain awareness is a challenge, I think, for everybody. Uh, as mentioned, one of my former jobs, I work at the U.S. Pacific Command and the Planning and Policy Directorate and uh, just working with the Navy there and even with the Coast Guard now. Having a good MDA picture of your smaller vessels is a major challenge for us. And particularly as you get farther offshore, even your larger vessels that are not AIS equipped, you know, having a picture of what they're doing is, is a big challenge for us overall. <clears throat> so let me stop there and let Chris right. take it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And over Thank to Captain Martina. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, give you a little 
glance behind the, the curtain. Uh, our staffs had the opportunity to work together. Uh, so we, I think if, if my folks put together a brief and, and uh, uh, Mr. Alley's folks put together a brief, you would find that they would be very similar. And it shouldn't be surprising due to the fact that we come from the same organization uh, with the same overarching goal. So mine takes just a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit more, more about requirements and such. Uh, but again, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm honored and I'm honored to be <coughs> provided and be sitting next to my esteemed colleague up here as well uh, for this. So first slide, if you would, please. Okay, what I would like to do today is just talk a little bit about uh, Coast Guard Aviation on the rotary wing side, who we are, where we are. Um, spend just a little bit of time and talk about our, uh, our two assets that we operate. Um, get into the specifics of those. Talk a little bit of about our uh, unique aspects of how we do our, our business uh, with regard to the missions and requirements within Coast Guard and Rotary Wing Aviation. Talk a little bit about our air surface interactions uh, and then finish up with a little bit of a way forward about our future vertical lift um, acquisitions and requirements and such. So, um, next, right on it. Next slide, please. No. Um, so, here's how we are laid out. Uh, basically, what you're looking at is, uh, is, is this is only our rotary wing aviation fleet that you see right here. And uh, again, we've got 25 rotary wing units that we operate uh, across the U.S., uh, including Puerto Rico, Hawaii, uh, and the Great Lakes. Uh, our fleet consists of 145 aircraft total, two types of aircraft, which I'll get to in subsequent slides here. Um, we monitor all coastal waters. We monitor, uh, monitor all navigable waters of the U.S., uh, any of those locations. It's, it's possible to find uh, Coast Guard helicopters. Uh, the most recent and upcoming location uh, that we're there on a, on a uh, not a consistent basis, but when needed, is the, uh, uh, is the Arctic. As the Arctic starts opening up to, to more and more commerce and more and more uh, U.S. business, you'll find that the Coast Guard will be, will be up there as well. 825 officers are what I have right now running the, uh, the uh, rotary wing side of the fleet. A uh, total of about 2,000 enlisted crew, mm -hmm. and uh, if you know the Coast Guard, we have about 4,100 folks total in Coast Guard aviation, so rotary wing aviation is roughly half of what we do. Um, but what everybody should get from this is that we are, <laughs> from the location, we are a maritime organization. Uh, our spots are all located next to the water, uh, and it, it, it makes sense considering the mission sets that we have. Uh, the Coast Guard, by law, has 11 statutory missions. Yeah. Just wanted to let you know that all our rotary wing aircraft are multi-mission. They are involved in every single one of those 11 missions. So, next slide, please. All right, this is our H-60, uh, one of our two aircraft. The, uh, the H-60 has been with us since uh, the late 80s is when we started the acquisition. Uh, we have 35 operational right now, and I have a total of 43 aircraft. And I say operational because uh, I think it's important to understand the, the way that we operate. Um, you know, again, I kind of joke about it, and it's not accurate, but I want to say it anyways. But you know, in DOD, if they need 50 planes, they buy 100 because they plan for attrition. They plan for, I mean, they, they're, to me, they're doing it correctly. A um, little bit different way that we do it in the Coast Guard, and it's just based on the way we grew up. I have 43 uh, H-60s. I need 43 H-60s. I don't have any attrition spares. Uh, I have them at operational units, and uh, the rest of them that aren't in operational units are actually engaged in the, uh, uh, the depot level maintenance program. So if they're not going through depot level maintenance, they're operational, and they just, they're nose to tail, and they just keep going through that cycle. They're used for four years, they're put through the cycle. So the bottom line there is we have just enough. The, uh, the operational aircraft that we have in H-60 is very similar to the uh, DOD and other maritime versions of the H-60. It's got a tight wheelbase so that we can land it on ships, um, and it's a great it's a great aircraft for us. Uh, for the Coast Guard, it represents our heavy lift aircraft. Uh, the, the pieces up there with regard to our capabilities are listed. The crews, I won't read those for you, but this is basically how we how we run that. Next slide. A little history of the H-60s. Again, we started it in uh, roughly the uh, the late 80s. 1989, I think, was our first acquisition. In the post 9-11 world of work, we found that we had some, not necessarily new missions, but we had some new emphasis on missions that we had already, or had always had. Uh, so we found out that we needed to start working on our rotary wing fleet and, and building the next generation of them. For, for those of you can remember back that far, we had, uh, we had a little integrated deep water system uh, piece that we worked with. Uh, one of the COAs that they had was to replace the H-60s with the AB-139. It was just a COA. Um, our, our course of action, but uh, what we found out is that the, 
the future demand set that we saw on our medium or larger aircraft that we operated, probably all those requirements would not have been handled by the, by the AB-139. Again, a fine aircraft, but just with the requirements that we had, it didn't, it didn't meet it. Um, so one of the pieces that we came up with this was an upgraded version of the H-60, uh, which has been our acquisition program for both our railroad wing aircraft is to keep them going. Plus the fact that it was relatively new aircraft, it made sense uh, to try to keep those. It was, it was good business sense for the American taxpayer. So what we've done in the recent past is we've done what we call discrete segments um, within our acquisitions. And what we mean by that is it's more or less just fancy words where it's a phased approach to getting the aircraft to where they need to be for the final, for the final uh, um, type. Within the H-60, we've upgraded the avionics. We now have the common avionics uh, system, very similar to what the Army has, the CAS. Uh, we've also provided enhanced uh, electro-optical and, and EO. We have a brand new suite on there as well. That new, with all these uh, pieces on board, it's now called the H-60 Tango. We've gone from the, the Juliet to the Tango, uh, and that was completed in 2014. End of service life expected for 2027 or so, just to kind of give you an idea of how long these things will be around. We were originally working with a, with a mindset that they would be available for 20,000 flight hours. Uh, working with Sikorsky, Sikorsky is very happy with the uh, depot level maintenance that we do and the unit level maintenance. And if we continue to do that, we're looking at taking those things beyond 20,000 flight hours. Next slide, please. All right, the second of our two aircraft, which is probably my favorite, I shouldn't say that because my our H-60 instructor here, um, is the H-65 Dolphin. Now, uh, again, this, uh, this aircraft has been with us since the late 80s. Uh, we have a total of 90 operational, 102 of them total per our program of record, although the fleet is down a little bit right now due to some, uh, due to some mishaps. It is without question the most prolific aircraft we have just, and that's basically due to the numbers of aircraft that we have. We have more than twice as many um, of those as we do the H-60s. It's all weather, day, night, just like the H-60. The only difference being is we do not allow this aircraft to fly in any icing at all. It just doesn't have the systems on board to, to deal with that. Uh, it is the aircraft that we're using for our airborne use of force mission, which we'll talk about in a second here. And it's also our rotary wing air intercept uh, aircraft that we use right here in the Cap National Capital Region. It is also the aircraft that we use for um, our shipboard deployments. It's, it's just because we have so many of them and um, it fits. So, next slide, please. Just real quick, a little bit of history. Um, again, acquired the first one in uh, 1984. Uh, the advancements to the, uh, from the original Alpha version were again done through our acquisition system. Uh, in terms of a in sort of a phased approach with discrete segments. Uh, the plane has gone through seven uh, distinct uh, discrete segments to get to where it's at right now. And actually six, I take that back, it's six. There's, there's some issues with one of them, but anyway, so. Um, we've upgraded the engines. We went from the original Lycomings to the turbo mechas. That was a major change for us. Gave us about 40% more power, uh, and it gave us a ton more reliability. It was the, it was a, the right move to make at the time. Uh, we've enhanced the fleet a little bit for the Airborne Use of Force mission for the National Capital Region. Um, that seemed to work out very well when we armed them. It became the Charlie version. We're just getting to the end of the Delta conversions right now, uh, which is brand new uh, digital GPS and a new inertial lab system. We are just getting ready to start the Echo transition, which will be the final transition for this aircraft. And that's going to include the CAS system, the common uh, avionics system on board, and also a, an upgraded AFCS system. Our transition to the Delta, again, is almost complete. The Echo is starting, and uh, we expect this plane to give us uh, well in excess of the 20,000 hours that we were planning per airframe. Uh, working with the uh, Airbus helicopter, we've done some analysis, and it looks like we're going to be able to, if we continue to do what we're doing, uh, and keep an eye on uh, specific components, we'll be able to take this plane to 30,000 hours. Again, that's nice for us because it allows us to not have to start recapitalizing these fleets until the mid-2020, 27 time frame, uh, depending on utilization. Next slide, please. Okay, as I said, I want to real quickly talk about just a couple of missions. We have uh, 11 statutory missions. Uh, I just want to hit on a couple of them, uh, the first of which is search and rescue. Uh, it should be no mystery to anybody, but our search and rescue uh, uh, mission is probably one of our, it's considered our bread and butter. 2016, we're coming up on our 100th year of Coast Guard aviation, which is a big deal to us. Uh, but the point I want to make for that is, you know, one of the original reasons that Coast Guard aviation was created was to serve in the, the search and rescue 
uh, realm. So the point is, uh, in the future, we're, our rotary wing aviation is, is also going to have to uh, take into account the, uh, uh, the search and rescue mission. So for major mission sets, this is one of our major end game pieces. The helicopters uh, and the small boats are probably the lion's share of the search and rescue that occur in the Coast Guard. Uh, so we'll need to continue to be able to operate in the maritime environment from ships. Uh, we're going to have to continue to lift people from the water short of a Star Trek transporter. That means we're probably going to be dealing with hoists for the next uh, foreseeable future. Uh, we, we just, we're going to be in the hoist business. Uh, we're going to have a rescue swimmer. Rescue swimmers have been a, a fantastic addition to our, our crews. Uh, so future versions of our rotary wing aircraft will also have to take care of the rescue swimmers. And again, as always, interoperable with our service fleets, both the large, uh, both the large ones and the small ones. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, one of two special missions I want to talk about. These are not uh, legislated missions. These are submissions under the larger uh, uh, categories, if you will. And the first one is, uh, is the Rotary Wing Air Intercept Mission. Um, now the Coast Guard is an interesting entity. We, uh, uh, we wear two hats. We wear a Title 10 military hat, and we wear a Title 10, I'm sorry, a Title 14 uh, uh, federal law enforcement hat. This is one of these missions that allows us to wear both hats uh, when needed. Um, the basic mission set falls under, for those that are aware of the National Capital Region uh, mission that we do, it falls under DOD. It is a NORTHCOM mission. Uh, we work for the DOD while we're doing it. Uh, Coast Guard's piece in this is actually an important piece. It's a small piece, but it's an important piece. We identify the low, slow flyers that may be uh, trying to bump into the National Capital Region airspace. We identify them, and then we pass that information on to the, the decision makers that make the bigger decisions, uh, if you catch what I'm saying. Um, so, but the other thing is we can, when necessary, we can switch hats in flight and actually uh, become a law enforcement entity. Uh, we can follow those aircraft, and once we have shuffled them off to perhaps an airport outside the area, we can actually land and conduct federal law enforcement. We don't always do it, but the possibility is there, and the DOD knows that we can do that. So, important mission set for us. Uh, push through here. The second one I just wanted to talk about real quick is our, uh, the other aviation special mission we're proud of is our Airborne Use of Force counter drug. Uh, this is a great mission. This is a mission we share with our CBP brothers and sisters um, because it's highly effective. Uh, for those of you who don't know the full history, uh, many, many years ago, uh, you, again, when, when you're dealing with uh, the, the criminal organizations, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. It's, they try to figure out how to get it in. We try to counter it. They try to counter our counter. There was a period of time where the go-fast boats, when they, when they transitioned from the low, uh, low, you know, the low speed uh, trawlers to get large shipments in, they transitioned to the, the go-fast threat. Uh, and it, it ate our lunch for some time. Uh, we had a very difficult time stopping those. Our vessels couldn't do it. Our, our uh, aircraft weren't armed. It was, it was nearly impossible to stop them. So what we did is we stood up a, a proof of concept back in 1999. It was originally called the Hitron 10 because we had 10 folks involved in the, uh, the program. Uh, we leased some aircraft. It was highly successful. Um, in fact, it was near 100%, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, uh, intercepts versus uh, uh, you know, interdictions. So with that and with the support of our senior leadership and our elected leadership, we were allowed to stand up our, our unit uh, in 2003, the Hitron, the Helicopter Interdiction Tactical Squadron. Uh, and they are there right now. Uh, we are down in Jacksonville, Florida. There's 10 aircraft, H-65s assigned to it. Uh, and since 2003, since the stand-up of the unit, I think we've accounted for nearly $12 billion worth of uh, contraband uh, as part of that program. And again, this is not just the Coast Guard. CBP uh, Air and Marine has this capability as well. Uh, and I know this is interest of, uh, of our senior leadership within the department to try to uh, uh, leverage the fact that we, we both can do this. So, next slide, please. And this is my uh, second to last slide. This is a very similar slide to uh, uh, the one that General uh, presented. But uh, again, it's a maritime con op. And uh, again, it's, if you take nothing else from the slide, it's the fact that we are operating within the department uh, with a phased or a layered defense approach, if you will. Um, it's, it's very, again, it's almost, other than the pictures being different, it's, it's very similar, if not identical to the one that uh, Mr. Alley's. Uh, provided. But the bottom line is just go through three pieces. The first layer is the persistent surveillance, and that's the top level. Persistence surveillance uh, provides you a uh, common operating picture for the units that you have down on the ground or on the water. Um, 
Right now we're using P3s, C130s, Dash 8s, C27s pretty soon, 144s. Uh, and actually the, the joint program run by uh, uh, CBP with the, uh, with the Predators is, is highly effective as well. So that's the big piece. It provides the large scale uh, uh, strategic piece, if you will, that our smaller units, the subunits, can operate within. The second layer of that is, the, uh, is what we like to think of as tactical surveillance or tactical sur uh, persistent surveillance. That's important because you can't have the big asset, the P3, the C-130, um, uh, you know, the medium altitude, long endurance uh, UAS, uh, basically hanging around the cutter or the boat. It's, it's, a waste of, it's a waste of an asset. You want them looking at the big picture. But once they've captured that big picture, you want to be able to hand that off to a smaller tactical picture. Historically, we've done that with our cutter helicopters. But as you can imagine, doing it with a helicopter is probably the most not, eco uh, most not the, at most, not the economical way to do it. There's better ways to do it. Um, the depiction we have right here demonstrates a small UAS launched from the cutter, which is our vision. It's what we're working on right now. And what that will do is it will provide the, uh, the ability for the larger strategic piece to continue to move on while the smaller tactical piece is able to pick up the target and track it. The third and final piece is the, uh, is the bottom section there. That's the end game. Uh, and for our piece, the end game could be uh, an H-65, a Hitron capable 65 that uh, puts a couple of 50 caliber rounds in the, uh, in the outboard motor, or it can be a small boat which is launched from the cutter and has the same capability to, to stop. Uh, regardless of who's doing the end game, uh, Coast Guard, uh, CBP, uh, local law enforcement, at the very end you have to have the, uh, the investigative side of the house start, and that starts with the apprehension. So again, it's a, it's a layered concept. It's similar to, regardless of what the mission is. This is a drug mission, if you want to think of it that way. If you're looking for a lost buoy, we could be doing the same thing. Find it with the big thing, you track it with a little thing, and you, and you go get it. Um, but you've got to have that end game, and that's the important part is you have to be able to track everything. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is my last slide, and I said I was going to go in a little different direction, so I want to talk a little bit about our future vertical lift piece. Uh, eventually, within the Coast Guard and with uh, Air Marine, we're going to have to restart replacing our, uh, our assets. Uh, we only have so many hours on our airframes, and the manner in which we use them on an annual basis will dictate to us when they need to start going. For our age 65s, for example, we fly 645 hours a year for our, uh, our uh, 700 for our age 60s. So again, we can track that out. Our engineers are, are pretty good with that. Uh, when the time does come, obviously the replacement is going to be a requirements-driven solution. Uh, and this time, a little bit differently than the past, uh, most likely it's going to be a uh, multi-agency requirements-driven solution. Uh, and, the, and the department is working on that. We have a joint requirements council working, joint requirements for entities and components within the, uh, the department. We would be... Uh, not doing a good thing for the, uh, for the American taxpayer if we, we didn't, didn't take all of those into account. Uh, again, Title 10 and Title 14 authorities for the Coast Guard, we need to keep that in mind. That'll drive some of our requirements. So in accordance with our uh, acquisition program, we'll be using mission needs analyses like we have in the past. We did one in uh, uh, 19, uh, we did 94, and before that it was like 88 or 89, but we're working on another mission needs statement right now to capture the current aspects of what we have for missions in the, in the Coast Guard. And uh, some of those pieces will include departmental uh, requirements. So we'll have the ability to hopefully uh, uh, work with them. We also have some organizational requirements. The Coast Guard is uh, within the Future Vertical Lift Partnership being run right now by DOD. I sit on the, the Council of Colonels on that. Um, we're just a little, little brother uh, involved in that. But by doing so, we're able to perhaps uh, shape a little bit of the future for the future vertical lift for, for the uh, you know, DOD and be able to leverage that. Because that's what it's all about. It's about leveraging the commonalities. Uh, and hopefully, if you're doing that correctly, you'll end up being able to you know, gain some economies across the, across the acquisitions. And that's not only a benefit for us, it's a benefit for uh, Customs uh, and, and ICE and, and everybody else that, that it needs airplanes in the future. So again, then my final piece here is, uh, is the uncertainties of what the future missions will be. It's nice to be able to build out an acquisition and build out a replacement to a fleet knowing exactly what it needs to do. Uh, but historically, we find that we change our priorities. We change because the demands change. Um, so I think one of the key pieces that I'll just lay out there is our last piece is when we replace these fleets, and not just the Coast Guard, but when, when the Air and Marine starts replacing their fleets, we're going to be looking for replacements uh, that are highly flexible. I mean, they have to be. We don't know what the threat vectors are going to be for us. 
Uh, right now, with the aircrafts that we have, uh, we're able to do that. The H-60 and the H-65 have, have shown to be uh, you know, highly flexible with regard to the missions that we put them in. Um, I suspect when we start buying aircraft in the 2020s, 2030s, I wouldn't be surprised if the helicopters that we bought look anything like helicopters from the past. Um, the technology is, is coming. It's, uh, you know, we're looking at 300 knot aircraft. We're looking at heavy lift. I mean, there's, there's really neat things coming down the line, and I'm very excited about it. But again, if we can get a, a, a future uh, uh, asset line that is, is flexible, I think we'll be doing the, the work that we're supposed to be doing. And that was my last slide. I tried to rush through it, and I apologize for spending too much time. But uh, there it is. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Well. Usually I ask the first couple of questions. I have a couple uh, in mind, but I would like to open it uh, up for your questions first. Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, just raise your hand, or if you have a question, wait for a microphone to come to you. State your name and affiliation if you have one, and then please um, ask your question in the form of a question, if you wouldn't mind. I'd appreciate it. Anybody? Up here first. <coughs> Hi, uh, Joe Gould from Defense News. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the last couple of years. There's in, in 2013, there was an IG's report that talked about H60 uh, procurement, and I wanted to ask if you could, you know, talk about that uh, report and what the way ahead has been since then. Uh, thank you. So, from our standpoint, we're looking at uh, you know the report basically was. Uh, asked it to do a cost evaluation between the Coast Guard Depot and the Army Depot uh, with somewhat of a competition, I guess, competition-based uh, uh, idea. Uh, so they did a substantial amount of work on looking at what those cost deltas would be. Uh, I don't think we found anything terribly significant there. We have looked at with the Army moving in a different direction. The Army has some aircraft that are more, the more excess aircraft coming in out of Iraq and Afghanistan. We're looking, uh, the, the uh, aircraft we're flying now that we we're gonna select are the A models. Those actual A models we're now looking at retiring and just uh, going right to L models. The Army is uh, in fact uh, has a surplus. So we haven't really closed the deal on that yet, but that's kind of the direction we're looking at now. Yeah, I'll just add to that that the, uh, you know, the H-60s that we operate uh, are a little bit different than the H-60s uh, that uh, uh, Air and Marine is operating. They come from different lineages, um, so they are, they're, they're different. However, I think what it does is that the key piece of it is that it has the attention of, uh, of our senior leadership that there are similarities, and those are the things that we should be looking at uh, within the acquisition processes. Uh, again, an alpha is not you know, it's, it's not going to uh, stand up uh, in many respects to the requirements necessary for, a, for an H-60 or a, a Tango, one of our Tango versions. Just because it came from a different location, it was designed for something different. Um, but the commonality is across those asset sets are the key piece. There are things that we can leverage, and I think that's, that's the, the direction we're heading is where we can make those leverage uh, uh, moves. We, we will make those leverage moves and hopefully save money and, uh, you know, and get the best, the best bang for the American taxpayer. Do you anticipate that there's something forthcoming with the Army in the near future, or is it still up in the air? Well, we're hoping to kind of work this out over the next year is our, is our intent right now. I mean, we're still, we have to work with the department on that, the actual future direction on that. That's kind of what we're looking at right now. All right. Anyone else? Please. Good morning. I'm Eileen Paris. I'm with Ericsson Aviation. And thank you so much for the briefing. It was very, very informative. And my question is specific to contract logistics support, and particularly if there is any interest going forward as the aircraft get older, um, any interest in wet or dry lease for both of the agencies to support your missions. And uh, also, specifically, I'm interested in the future of the Arctic and particularly with the Arctic Council now being led by the United States, um, how you see future aircraft needs going forward, particularly to the Arctic. Thank you. I can start that. Sure. Sir. Um, with regards to the, the CLS, is, can I use the term CLS? Is yeah. that okay? Um, you know, we have, we have a historic, within the Coast Guard, we have a, a historic utilization uh, a program, if you will, that's based upon our users of the aircraft also being the maintainers of the aircraft. So we're set up just a little bit differently uh, than AMO is. However, <coughs> the, the basic answer that I have is best value. 
best value is what we're looking for. Um, right now, I can tell you we have a bi-level uh, um, uh, maintenance concept where we have everything pretty much laid out uh, within our ALC, the Aviation Logistics Center down in uh, Elizabeth City. And then they are the, the hub, if you will, for the, the rest of the spokes, which are our aviation units. And they maintain unit level maintenance requirements and then unit level uh, um, maintenance you know, shelves, if you will. Uh, as far as the Arctic goes, very excited. Um, a lot of people still question why we even care about the Arctic. The bottom line, it's, it is the United States. Up to this point, there hasn't been a lot of uh, effort and action up there. Things are changing. And if American citizens are up there, and if they have the possibility of getting in trouble, if there's American business going on up there, then obviously our, our job is to, is to be up there and, and basically carry out the Coast Guard's business. So I anticipate that we will, we will be there to do what we need to do. Yeah, on our side, on the contract side, uh, we are on a con basically an exclusive contract uh, maintained Air Force. So uh, all of our aircraft, the P-3, the uh, UAS, and uh, then our other uh, tactical aircraft are all maintained on different contracts. So we have no one in the organization that actually performs maintenance. We oversight the maintenance. We also, as our model, use either commercial or military depots as our source of basically rework. So we are not, we are not uh, and this gets back to basically best value, numbers of airplanes we have, those kinds of things. Uh, and what the cost would be to actually try to maintain that kind of infrastructure ourselves, it doesn't really make sense. So we're basically exclusively using either, you know, the Army or maybe, maybe in the future the Coast Guard or for our commercial air aircraft like the A-Star or the DHC-8. Uh, those are all done at commercial depots or commercial facilities because that infrastructure all exists out there anyway for, for commercial utilization. And we're anticipating staying on that model unless we see something significantly different uh, that would uh, be a cost benefit for us to move away from it. If, if I could just add, um, here at CSIS, we had a, a very robust Europe program. It is now the uh, program on Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. Uh, we've been undertaking some Arctic research ourselves here at CSIS over the last five years. So we're very excited about the U.S. presidency of the Arctic Council. That said, um, I personally am involved in a project going forward. We're launching it this month um, where we are looking at Europe and con considering the Arctic part of that in, in, in terms of what, it, what are NATO requirements, not only just um, aircraft requirements, but everything going forward, looking at it, a couple of different scenarios. So watch this space here at CSIS because I think uh, we'll you'll be seeing something come out of it. Hmm. Anyone else? There in the back, please. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, vo both for being here today. My name is Connor Martin. I work for the Charles Group. We're a consulting firm in DC, focused on a lot of aviation things. And my question is for uh, Commissioner Alice. Um, I know this is about vertical lift, but if you could talk a little bit more about the future of the MEA fleet, uh, where you see that in, to in terms of total asset strength and uh, maybe some projections about you know, how far out it will take before that fleet is, is kind of finalized and operational. Yeah, so on that particular fleet, we were hoping to buy those at higher rates than we are now. Basically, the budget is what the budget is. I mean, uh, so we're buying those at just a couple of year. Uh, we originally set an end, an end state goal of around 50. We're looking at that now to see if we uh, can refine that requirement more. Uh, in that case, it probably would drop. Uh, but that's not determined at this point now. We're still looking at what that might look like. And then we're also currently in the process of working to what the different configurations are going to look like. So we're going to have, a, we have a, the aircraft we've bought so far are maritime focused. They have a maritime radar on them. Uh, we also will look at a, uh, you know, down the road, a, a land variant, whether we want to take this Vader radar system we currently employ in the uh, Predator and put it on the, the, the uh, B-350, which the Army is currently doing. Uh, we're looking at that as a potential land variant. And then we're also looking at replacing our, what are called Letzi airplanes, law enforcement technical collection uh, aircraft uh, that we have out of Albuquerque with the MEA in the long run, which would be in that configuration. So kind of three different configurations of the aircraft is what we anticipate in the future. We're kind of, again, working through what the actual end state numbers look like at this time. But I would say that's gonna stretch out 2025 at the current rates we're on right now, uh, just at the current buy rates we're on. Okay. Any other questions? Sir, I had a question. You said um, a lot of the air aircraft that you get out of, um, or a lot of the aircraft that you operate are excess um, surplus from, from DOD. And I know that uh, there are programs in place by which they can transfer um, 
assets to law enforcement agencies, one, yours being one of them. Are you satisfied with how that has worked out um, in terms of what is available, the process, how quickly it goes? And the reason I ask is that um, you know these programs have come under fire um, recently, uh, beginning with the Ferguson, Missouri events of last year. Um, CBP does benefit from some of the same programs that local law enforcement benefits from in terms of excess property from DOD. Can you? Are you, are you satisfied with the kind of aircraft assets that are available to you through, through those programs? So one standpoint you have to look at, and I, so let me just kind of verge off to the first part, the last part of it right. first, which is, you know, what do you equip your law enforcement organizations with? And that's a question that, you know, right. that we need to answer as, you know, an American people, you know, uh, I don't think so much for the Department of Homeland Security, we're not so much taking on those assets, but local police forces are, and whether they need that equipment or not, I mean, is a question to be asked. So I'm not gonna propose to answer that one there, but I would say that uh, there's concern about it, uh, and what your police forces look like, do they get militarized? They look like military forces, you have to, have to just look at that and uh, you know see what's gonna fit. That has its own issues, I'll just give you an example. I caution my guys on body armor, if you show up at an airport to check somebody's license and you're in body armor, that sends a message to somebody. Right. Okay, well that can be worn underneath your gear. It doesn't have to be worn as a tactical vest. So kind of how you portray yourselves, I think, is a major concern to the American population. And you can kind of set a certain tone depending on what you look like and the kind of equipment you equip yourself with. So that would be one side of it. I think the other part of it is there is, I will say now on the actual aircraft side, this used to work uh, actually very well. And uh, in recent years, as the DOD budgets have gone down, these guys are Title 10, we're not. Right. They want to charge us for all the airplanes. So that's a substantial problem for us now, because uh, now I'm uh, kind of you know in the used car business here, right. buying used, used aircraft from DOD. And that's been a substantial problem for us here as of late in getting airplanes out of them, because they'll, they'll throw them over to the foreign military sales market, uh, you know, or the services will get yeah. first pick. Uh, at, at a free value, and uh, that used to be how we worked with them. That's no longer the case. So that's a substantial problem for us. Interesting. So it's not so much a transfer anymore. It's it's a got to buy them basically. Interesting. Yeah. So it's now the cost is not what a new airplane costs. But uh, for instance, uh, you know, I was asked about the Blackhawks. We're going to have to pay some amount of money for those aircraft. Interesting. And and to be honest, obviously, since they're access to Defense Department, they they were built for Defense Department requirements, which may not exactly be a complete overlap with what you need them for. Yeah, and any so, airplane I get, which gets to the cost, has to be missionized for my configuration. Exactly. Otherwise, their radios won't work with law enforcement radios, as an example. So you have to missionize the airplane. Okay. Anything else? And this, unfortunately, they have to be the last question. That's all we have time for. So I just wanted to ask a follow-up to that. You said that originally the, the plan was to go with um, uh, Alpha Model Blackhawks, and now it's Lima Model Blackhawks. Is there going to be a substantial cost difference? And, um, you know, is the, is the capability um, really what you're after the, in the Lima model? Does that, does that fit the mission? Yes, it will. The aircraft will be missionized. The cost is significantly less. Because what was happening to the Alphas, they, had, they were going through a service life extension, which basically means strip the airplane down to the, you know, the studs, uh, replace all your dynamic components, overhaul everything. That was a fairly substantial uh, cost. Because the A models, if you keep in mind, are the oldest Blackhawks in the world. Uh, so they were reaching their limits. And as we brought them in for their inspections, we were finding more and more cracks that we couldn't repair. And they were you know, deemed unflyable at that point. So, that, so the L models are much newer aircraft. Uh, so we're not, we would not, they would not be slept, and that's the part of the cost that's not going to be there. Okay. So it'll be substantially less. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much for your thank presentations you. as well as your candor and, and answering questions. Um, and please join me in, in thanking our panelists. <laughs>